Let's have the first man. He was an enormously talented man. I mean, a rather sort of brilliant man, but he was very, very anarchic. And he could just cause chaos just by walking into the room. Oh, oh, Anomaly. <laughs> I think Norman was as big a star as we can make in Britain. <laughs> Audiences just couldn't believe this extraordinary character. He used to work like a horse, he really always worked very hard. Oh, no, don't stop. Be awful, man. <laughs> <laughs> when we were at home, just in any situation, his timing would be spot on. <laughs> He can make a laugh from anything, really. Doesn't need a script. The cleverness of movement and ability to trip over and not hurt himself. That's uh, so clever, really. <laughs> he was completely um, innocent in a way. Children liked him, everybody liked him. There wasn't anybody who didn't like Norman. He will always be remembered. I mean, who could forget Norman Wisdom? I'm not good looking. I'm not too smart. On screen, we saw the master fool a cheeky comic character with great musical talent and a physical prowess which made Norman Wisdom Britain's biggest and most bankable film star of the 50s and 60s. His was a natural talent. Norman's upbringing lacked the luxury of formal training. Indeed, it lacked any luxury at all. When asked about his childhood, he would always deliver an old music hall gag. I was born in very sorry circumstances. Both of my parents were very sorry. <laughs> yeah, really, yeah. Behind the jokes lay a dreadful reality. Life was tough for young Norman and his elder brother Fred. Raised in this house in London's Maida Vale, in 1915 this area was poverty stricken. More devastating still, at the age of nine, Norman's family was torn apart. His father, a chauffeur, was violent and neglectful. His mother felt forced to leave home. Norman's life in the early years was quite hard because uh, his father was quite cruel. His background was horrendous. I mean, a dreadful, dreadful family life, like absolutely beaten and punched and kicked and knocked about by his father. He used to wallop me and, and, and my brother, and, uh, but it did me good in a way because I remember on one occasion he, he picked me up, and this is really true, and he, he threw me up and I hit the ceiling, really too, and, and I came down and landed just, just by the, the sink, which we used to have then in the drawing room, <clears throat> and um, it taught me how to fall, you know. Between the ages of nine and 11, Norman and his brother lived more or less as street urchins. Attending school barefoot, they regularly stole food to survive. To be discarded by your parents at an early age, um, I mean, he stayed with his grandmother for a period. But, um, you know, you really are fending for yourself. Um, you know, it's uh, something that you wouldn't even dream about, really. He had it rough. He really did. And I think that's what gave Dad the determination um, to, you know, make something of his life and not continue sort of, like, living like that. At the age of 13, Norman left school. He walked from London to Cardiff to look for work. He told me that he was going with a friend, and I said, well, how did you eat? Where did you sleep? It took you two weeks. What did you do? What were the practicalities? And he said he took a sandwich, and uh, they just used to sleep rough in a hedgerow. Before he knew it, he was a cabin boy on this ship, the Mainly Court, 
bound for Argentina. It was a hard life, but it was, it was very helpful for, you know, the life to come. I, I, I learned boxing, for instance. Um, Who told you that? Because they, well, the, the blokes used to be on the, on the deck, you know, all doing the sparring for exercise and so forth. I used to stand and watch them, and one day they said, um, hey, do you want to join in, son? He spent three months at sea. Feeling proud of his achievements, Norman headed back to London to trace his estranged father. Norman, when he was about 14, decided to find out where his dad was and went and asked his grandmother and, and she, she gave him this address. And he, and he goes round and, and, and he stands outside the house and then he plucks up the courage and he goes and knocks on the door and the woman opens the door and she said, yes, and he said... Um, Can I see Mr Wisdom? She said, who are you? And I said, Norman. And it was his next wife, or his other wife. And so she, she said, oh, well, come in. He'll be back from work in about half an hour. And I went in and I sat in the lounge. And then when he came in, I heard uh, some chat between his wife and himself. And he just came in. And this is, on my word of honour, true. He just opened the door, looked at me and said, out. And I, I, I went out and I walked down the steps. There were about three or four steps down. I stood in the road. He slammed the door and I said, I'll... I'll never see you again, I never did. There you are. True. It was a short, sharp exchange and that was it. Um, what can you say? I mean, um, it was out and that was it. I think, how'd you get over that? How would you get over that? And, and, then, and then, you know, years later to go on and make, make the world laugh, you know. Norman had no choice but to live on the streets. His regular sleeping spot still popular with the homeless today, was next to the martial folk statue. He was 14 years old. Salvation came in the form of the army. I was honestly sleeping rough, uh, just off Grosvenor Square, you know, in doorways and all that sort of thing, and, and hungry, and at about half past two in the morning, I used to get up and go to a coffee store keeper, and I used to just look over the desk at the top, of, you know, the shelf, like that, sadly and he'd push me a hot pie and a cup of bovril. Really true. And after about six or seven nights of that, he said to me, why don't you join the army? I said, I can't get in the army at my size. He said, well, you've got to do something. He said, well, why don't you just go and try it? Kid him. And kid him he did. 14-year-old Norman, just four foot ten and a half inches and five stone nine, enrolled as a band's boy. Joining the army was the best thing he ever did. He had friends and he had travel and he had a bed to sleep in. And his life changed completely. He'd had no home, had he? He'd had no home life as such. And then he goes in the army and that, becomes, that, that became his life. You know, Sergeant Major or whoever became his, his, his dad because he didn't really have a dad. Uh, and, and the other soldiers became his brothers and stuff like that. So he did, he did love the army because he'd had nothing else. For him, it was absolutely marvellous because he had three meals a day and was looked after. It must have been finding mum again, I should think. Well, I'll tell you what, on my word of honour... Yes. I, ..I owe everything of my good fortune to the army. It gave him so much, and it? it? gave him discipline and cleanliness, the music, you know, the chance to go on the stage. He learned to horse ride and do all that sort of stuff while he was in the army. So I, I can understand why, why he loved it so much. There was 14 boys, and we were all different instruments, and we used to get fed up playing the same one, so we all used to get up and go on the others. So gradually I learned to play the lot. Clarinet, saxophone, French horn, trumpet, drums, piano. Um, that'll do. <laughs> Five years of Norman's tour of duty was spent in India. He became the flyweight champion of the British troops in 1936. He'd also discovered a talent for comedy. What made him realise that, that he could make people laugh was apparently they, would, they were putting on a show and doing some sort of entertainment. And um, he started doing a tap dance in his army boots. And they started to laugh at him because it just looked so ridiculous. And in his head he was thinking, oh, they're laughing at me. And that's where it all started. After seven and a half years, he demobbed to launch himself as a variety artist. His first significant booking was at the Coliseum Portsmouth in 1945. At the age of 30, he was still unknown, though he'd invented the stage persona which would immortalize him, that of the little man in the overtight suit, which he called the Gump. 
early 1947, I had been booked uh, at a summer season at, at Scarborough. Mm -hmm. And there was, I was sharing a dressing room with a conjurer. And we used to do a different show every week. And I'd got the material for the four shows, you know, because I was only in about 10, 10 or 15 minutes each show. And, but this conjurer was having difficulty with his last show. And he said, I'll tell you what, Norman, when, if I ask someone to come up from the audience to help me do the tricks, it could be you. I said, yeah, all right, then. He said, uh, dress scruffy. I said, OK. So I went out and I bought a suit for 30 shillings and a cap for one shilling. And when he invited someone up from the audience, that was me. I came up and it worked so well, we were booked at the end of that season as a double act. We did well, but he didn't want to be a double act, neither did I. He wanted to go his way and so did I. But that's how it all started with the Gump suit. This great Gump character that he created, this sort of ill-fitting suit and this sort of the, the cheeky clap, cap to one side, um, was this icon. I mean, I put Norman's sort of um, Gump character in the same league as uh, Chaplin's Tramp. It sort of fits that comedy icon, the little boy lost that um, we all love. Norman was appearing all over the country as a supporting act. By chance, one of the biggest stars of the day caught his performance. There'll be bluebirds over the white cliff of Dover. Well, I first saw Norman's act when uh, I first came down to live in Sussex just after the war. And uh, we, um, my husband and I, were going to the theatre, a very small theatre in Brighton, uh, to see uh, an act that was top of the bill. And uh, we saw this little chap come on who, who wasn't very highly billed, I think that hadn't heard of him before. And he was so funny, he had me in stitches. And it takes a lot, really, to make me laugh the way that I laughed. And I thoroughly enjoyed him. And I thought, well, I've never seen or heard of him before, but... He really is going to go somewhere. We meet again, don't know when, don't know when. And they did meet again. In 1947, Vera Lynn was at the height of her career. She was booked to top the bill at the Victoria Palace, and at the bottom of the bill was Norman Wisdom. Smiling through. I was due to go on at a certain time and he was getting very nervous because I, I was going on in the first half, closing the first half, which is a very important spot. And uh, he was getting very nervous and, and I didn't mind what time I, I went on. So I said, would you like to swap places? So he said, oh yes, could I please, you know, yes. He said, you know, I'd like to get it over. He received three ovations. Vera's generous act was the turning point of his career. I really didn't think any more about it. And, uh, but then the first time I met him after the occasion, he reminded me, and, and every time we met, he reminded me. And he used to say how much he owed me. Uh, he didn't owe me anything. He, whatever he achieved, he owed to his own talent. <laughs> Norman was about to become one of the top entertainers of the era. In the audience at the Victoria Palace was the agent Billy Marsh, the man who would launch Norman's career in films. Billy was one of the most respected agents in the business. Everybody knew Billy. He was with the Delphont organization. And uh, Billy made a point of trying to make uh, all these sort of up-and-coming people into major stars, Morecambe and Wise, Bruce Forsyth, and, of course, Norman. And uh, Billy also went across to America with him and uh, really looked after his career, and be they became great friends as well. It was Billy Marsh who secured Norman's seven-year contract with the Rank Organization. Norman's debut as a film star was in the 1953 release of Trouble in Store, where Norman played a hapless shop assistant called Norman Pitkin. What on earth are you doing here? Well, Mr. Freeman sent me. I'm the new window dresser. You? How utterly grotesque. 
suddenly became the biggest box office draw in the country and um, his films were making more money than James Bond films in the early 60s. So, I mean, he was a huge comedy star and this whole sort of Norman franchise came up around it. So, Trouble in Store was probably the one that began the whole legend of Norman Wisdom. he became a star. I imagine Ranks made his first film, you know, under sufferance and, oh, well, with a, you know, with a low budget and all of that. At the time, the Rank organisation took a chance on Norman Wisdom. OK, he was a recognised uh, stage success and stage comedian, but films is a different beast altogether. But um, so apparently at the, uh, the premiere for Trouble in Store, he was uh, stood there with all these big wigs coming in, Earl St John, the, the head of Rank, and all these guys coming in. Being frightfully snobbish and sort of just thinking he was some piece of dirt that had been brought in. I was too scared to look at the screen. I was watching the audience's faces, hoping that they laugh, and luckily me, they did. And after the film was finished, they were a different crowd of people coming out. The Earl St. John's and the John Davis and everybody, they were coming out and saying, Norman, oh, Norman. Oh. <laughs> it's a very, very English story, isn't it? The idea that he then became a film star. Trouble in Store broke box office records. Norman received the British Film Academy Award for Most Promising Newcomer. He would go on to star in 17 further films. When the British film industry was going in to decline, I think Norman actually kept the British film industry afloat. They made a fortune for the Rank organisation, he really did. I mean, he kept Pinewood Studios going for nigh on 15 years. Um, sometimes it was only him and the carry-ons that were actually in there making movies, so it was a very important part of the industry as well as, you know, making millions of people laugh. <laughs> The film plots were based on recurring themes. The character, Norman Pitkin, the good guy, pulling through against the odds and always getting the go. My favourite Norman Wisdom film is probably The Square Peg, because I love sort of army comedies and things, and I love the great cast in that one of Blackman's a wonderful leading lady. A square peg in the round hole. You're in the army now. Try and get out. Here we are, miss. Why don't you look where you're going, lunatic? I seem to remember that I was an officer in the army. And at the beginning of the film, I'm based in England, and that's where Wizzy sees me and falls in love with me. Well, he was a little private, wasn't he, Private Pitkin? And um, God knows how the army put up with him, I don't know. Mr Grimsdale, she saluted me. I think I'll have another one. There was one particular scene where he's just learnt to salute and he sees me coming along and he thinks how wonderful uh, he can salute and so he keeps running ahead and hiding around corners and everything to give himself the opportunity of saluting again. I don't remember what my reaction was. A raised eyebrow, I should think. Haven't I seen you somewhere before? Yes, miss. Last time we met I was in Civvy Street. Norman's character was often pitted against an authority figure, memorably played by Edward Chapman. A scenario which gave Norman his most famous line. Mr. Grimsdale! Picking up the mortise craft to tell you we're not here to give all the dogs of the neighborhood free meat. It was mostly bone, Mr. Grimsdale. Good morning, Mr. Grimsdale. Over the years, many fine actors also took on the role of the straight man. Hello. The late David Lodge appeared in many hits, such as The Bulldog Breed and On the Beat. And that's what you have to copy. When there's a comic and the straight man, the better the straight man, the funnier the comic. And he was aware of that because years before me, he had Jerry Desmond, who was not only a fine-looking man who was tall, but he had power. You've got to have that certain power for him to bounce off.
By now, Norman had developed a skill for causing a riot on set. We laughed. It, I used to look forward to going to work. Now pick it. One scene in the film, On the Beat, created a particular challenge. I feel I'll be able to this it. man he was going to play, the crook, was very fey. And I had to teach Norman how to walk with his hand on his hip and do it. And when we did it, because I had to do this, and it was hysterical. As you put your foot forward, yeah. you let your weight rest onto it so that your hip swings outwards. Oh, yeah, yeah. You then change feet. That is to say, you tread on the other one, transferring the weight in exactly the same manner. Now, this you continue to do alternately. Now, have you He walked behind me, and of course, he hips? tripped up. Uh, and the producer hands. took us both outside the studio, and he said, you two have got to get yourself together. It's costing me so many thousands a minute. I said to Norman, look, you're a star, you can do this. It's my living, you know. He said, all right, eh? I said, can you do it? Can you get through the scene? Yes. No, hand, shoulder high. We came in, I said, right, action. And we did it, and then as we did it, we fell on one side, screaming of laughter, and Asher was on the floor with a handkerchief in his mouth. But we got the scene. Oh, sir, he's fabulous! Can I get my uniform now, sir? By all means. Oh, thank you, sir. <laughs> we come to the fact that Norman was a little man with a giant ego, which is what I always think. But he, he was big in as much as he did what he bloody wanted to do. And nobody would ever tell Norman. He would do the most daring things. Oh, yeah. I heard the result of the two o'clock on the radio, so I had to come. You know, I'm excited, isn't it? <laughs> We're absolutely hysterical, aren't we, Miss Daddy? Norman used to disappear. We'd be out shooting on location somewhere. And, and the director said, we'll get Norman now. We'll do scene 42. And they say, well, no, where's Norman? Where is Norman? Norman nobody could find him. And they had megaphones almost in those days. They used to scream, right <laughs> where? Norman! <laughs> He'd gone. He disappeared. I mean, absolute. There is no other person I've ever worked with that would have got away with that. This is the BBC Home Service. Throughout the 1950s and 60s, Norman was one of the nation's best-loved film stars, seldom off the national news. He was also in great demand as a variety performer. Wherever he went in public, he would appear in character, demonstrating the remarkable dexterity which had long become his trademark. I thought he was a bit of a nutter, frankly, when I first met him. I think we all did, really. Certainly, if there's one pair of eyes watching him, he's performing. He's a, he just entertains instinctively. Uh, he, he, that's who he is. If you're there, he's got to make you laugh. One would call him a comic, really. Comic mover. Uh, an ability to you know, look as though he was going to kill himself by falling over, and he, he lands up um, like a cat does, you know, unhurt. I mean, the last time I had, I had breakfast with him was about sort of 8 o'clock in the morning. I, I went down, and Norman was just going into the, into the restaurant, and there was one little step, so he obviously done his little fall, got up, come to the table, and he'd already been for a four-mile walk. Norman always maintained his fitness. And on camera, he endeavoured to perform his own stunts, however demanding <laughs> or bizarre. On one occasion, much to Norman's disappointment, a stuntman was booked to perform an ambitious scene. On the first take, the stuntman broke his arm. The film star cheerfully stepped in. 
The result in the 1963 film A Stitch in Time is pure Norman wisdom. Pitkin will be disappointed in missed all the excitement. I remember, like, holding myself watching this scene. It was unbelievable. So calm, so corny. But God, the way he pulled it off, it was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. <laughs> yeah. And it takes a lot, it takes a lot for me to laugh out loud. It really, really does. <laughs> but honestly, I used to just scream laughing at him, you know. Mm. I love him, I love the man. Afternoon. What's he doing out of bed? <laughs> he walked and he jogged and he rode his bike and this helped him with his act as well because he learned how to tumble and how to fall without hurting himself. And one of the lines he used to use in his concert uh, was that he just used to think of the money and he was okay. The big revelation I had about him was this thing of thinking he was a bit of a twit. He wasn't. And it, it was when you realised this, when you started to work with him and talk to him, uh, you realised, he, although he was a sort of loner in a way, he, he was a very bright man and uh, was quite able. And uh, probably from his background, he had to be. He had to be a bright man to cope. What a delightful little fella. <laughs> Behind Norman's huge success lay a complex private life. Married briefly and divorced in his 20s, aged 32, Norman proposed to his second wife, Frida, on Bournemouth Pier. As a young army man, Norman had resumed contact with his mother. Though the family were rarely gathered together, here they all are. His mother, Maud, his brother, Fred, whom he'd lost contact with for 16 years, at Norman's wedding to Frieda in 1947. Norman knew the value of forgiveness. Despite his troubled upbringing, he embraced Maud into his life. His mother and brother died in the same year, 1971. Frieda and Norman had two children, Nick and Jackie. Growing up with Norman Wisdom as your dad was as much fun as you might imagine. He wasn't really a disciplinarian, because my mother was a disciplinarian, but she really was never going to win because, I mean, we'd have tea and he'd put the dog on the table. <laughs> you know, the dog's coming on the, to have tea with us, you know, and she'd just sort of shake her head, you know. I can remember when I was little, my mum was taking me up to the, the flat in London and I love after eight minutes and dad knew exactly what I would do because as soon as we got into the flat I make a little beeline for the sweet tray in in the lounge and there is sitting an after eight you know box and I just open it up and on the top is a little note that dad's written and it just says I'm watching you Jackie and the whole box went flying up in the air and I just ran out of the room screaming my head off because I was convinced he was hiding behind a curtain or something. So he did love to tease. To his children, he was both father and film star. They grew up watching him on the set, even managing to get in on the act in Follow a Star. I think it was 1959, I just played the piano. Well, I didn't play it, I pretended to have a piano lesson. <laughs> That's all, thank you, Nicholas. Same time. They're very exciting going to Pyman Studio. Everybody wanted to be on the Norman Wisdom set. <laughs> very good. Mum said, Jackie, why don't you go along and, you know, sit on the stool in front of the piano? So I said, OK. And, and then they started, you know, action. And Hattie Jakes came in. Judy, Judy, read this. But they'd actually muted the, the, the piano, so when you played, 
no sound came out, so I just went, Mum, this piano doesn't work. Cut. It's outrageous! You know, I kept on turning round and looking at Hattie Jakes and they had to cut again because they were saying, Jackie, can you try and face forward? And then the next time I was sort of staring right into the camera lens, you know, what's that? So I think, you know, they wouldn't be hiring me again. He was a lot of fun, but most of the time he was pretty normal. The minor side, we didn't see a lot of him. Life on the road also put great strain on Norman's marriage. In 1969, he was busy forging a successful career in the United States. He did films in America. He did um, Androcles, Androcles and the Lion for Noel Coward. He also did uh, Walking Happy on Broadway. And it was on Broadway, whilst he was working there, that he heard that his wife had gone off with another fella. My, my wife uh, at home, uh, had found somebody tall and good-looking. <laughs> I think if Norman had stayed in America, he would have been a big international star in the States as well. But I think Peter Sellers eventually got that slot as the English funny man, and the rest is history. We had uh, normal family problems, and I had to come back from America to look after my two lovely children, and I'm glad I did, and that's the end of that. The man who'd been abandoned as a child was granted custody of his own children. Their mother remarried, keeping in contact. Norman never married again. My mother left home and I was absolutely devastated. And, um, but he found, he found a wonderful lady um, called Madge. And we used to call her Magic because that's exactly what she was. And Dad made sure that because he obviously was still away, you know, working hard, that um, Madge was there to look after us, and she, she really was a very, very special lady. He was a loving father at that time, and, um, and uh, but I think probably um, I should have seen a little bit more of my mother. You know, she was, she was a good woman, and, um, um, you know, it was an acrimonious split. The BBC presents The Norman Wisdom Show. By the 1970s, Norman was a screen and stage star. But the pressure was now on to make it in television. He did some good shows in the 70s, um, just called Norman, Nobody is Norman Wisdom, those sort of things, a little bit of wisdom um, for ATV. And they were successful, um, but they weren't sort of legendarily successful, so they're not repeated now, for example. You don't see them on, on TV. I made sure that he was on every radio show we could get him on or television appearances. He didn't want to do them because he was Norman Wisdom and he, he felt, you know, do I need to do this? But I think with the public, you have to keep that profile high. Norman toured worldwide. And from the 1980s onward, he featured in cameo roles in some of our best loved series, such as Bergerac, I'll see if we can pick him out, all right? We'll send a car around for you. Um, well, yeah, all right. Nothing wrong, is it? No, 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 it's just that, you know, I haven't done anything like that before, that's all. This is one office, this. And last of the summer wine. <laughs> I'm an honest man. Has to be admitted. She needs a touch of work. <laughs> Unfortunately, the one big TV role he was offered, Frank Spencer, in Some Mothers Do Have Them, he had to turn down because of other commitments. Well, Some Mothers Do Have Them was actually written for Norman, but there were scenes in it where they wanted him to put his foot down the toilet and, and do things like that, involved with what he thought was lavatorial humour. I'm Mr Spencer. <laughs> the wife's a bit tired, so I thought I'd try you. <laughs> And consequently, he thought, well, this isn't for me, because he was squeaky clean at the time. And so, consequently, pulled out of it, and Michael Crawford got it. Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! 
that could have been uh, the big sort of TV break and on the, off the back of the films from the 60s into the 70s and early 80s he could have been doing this sort of comedy again for television generations and he regretted that for the rest of his life. Don't cry, honey, don't cry. Get off! But there were no regrets attached to Norman's role in a television play released in 1981. It cast Norman in a whole new light, receiving critical and audience acclaim. The BBC Playhouse Going Gently, directed by Stephen Frears, featured Norman and Fulton Mackay as terminal cancer patients. Did you drink? Top of orders. And what do the Wizards of the Knife have in store for you? They're going to give me an exploratory operation. Fun. How do you know? Tomorrow they're going to make it a triumvirate. Jeez. We talked to a lot of people about being in it. And then his name was on a list, and I said, oh, that's a rather interesting idea. I think this is a rather wicked thought. I think I thought that if you wanted to, if you were dying and wanted a rather graceful death, you might well wake up and find that Norman was in the bed next to you. <laughs> he was so disruptive and anarchic that any thoughts of a quiet, dignified, heroic death would immediately be uh, destroyed. What's the matter with you? I can't understand you at all. He wasn't such a bad fella. Do you need him? Probably not. I just said he wasn't such a bad fella. <laughs> you all right? I had to get up my courage to cast him. And I suppose I'd assumed that he'd be very good, and he was very good, so... Uh, but I could see that I was using bits of him that weren't people didn't normally ask for. During, during lunch, Stephen Freer said, Norman, I want specifically for you to avoid doing any comedy. And I said, well, you know, it's a straight play. He said, yes, I know, but I want you to avoid doing any comedy with the straight play. I could see what he was getting. I couldn't help saying, I, I couldn't help pulling his leg a bit. I said, well, look, no, if I'm in a, a night shirt, he said, you will be. I said, well, there's, for instance, certain comedy within the bounds of the play. If, if as I walk away from the bed, having got out, and I catch my night shirt on the spring of the bed, as I walk away, eventually it'll tighten up and pull me back like that, and I put my foot in the chamber pot underneath the bed. <laughs> and he'd gone pale. <laughs> he would just send me up hopelessly. I asked him. And? Not too good. It never is. <laughs> what am I going to do? Complain. Moan like the rest of us. <laughs> How long have you got? I didn't say. But my guess is six weeks, maybe seven. Give me six. I've got to have longer. He just was very, very powerful and potent and expressive. Um, and that's always a pleasure. Certainly I didn't realise before that you could strip away all these, the faces and, and the agility and all that and just leave that uh, little man underneath. He'd acquired a sort of wisdom by then. Uh, I imagine... I mean, I imagine that life had been quite rough to him in the previous 10 or 15 years. Going Gently won a BAFTA and established Norman as a serious actor. Even so, he continued to stay in comic character publicly and his ability to cause chaos in interviews was by now legendary. Oh, I'm not this. <laughs> it is difficult to know what he's going to do, especially if you don't know him, because um, he can do anything. He can, he can wind people up. He's, a ter he's got a terrible sense of humour. Let's go. 
good to see you. Thanks. It's time to sit down there. Norman, over there. He could just cause chaos just by walking into the room. You could see people getting nervous and sort of looking for the exits, and he was very, very unsettling. Well, thank you very much, sir. No, please, don't do it. Oh, 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 God! Oh, oh good God. Lord, there's me back gone. Oh. Well, taking my life in my hands, because I admired Norman so much, I asked if he'd take part in an hour special, which he did, and he was absolutely brilliant. <laughs> Interviewing Norman was hell. I mean, he was... Uh, a brilliant raconteur, and uh, he knew exactly how he was going to time every gag, and that was the way. And you couldn't just ask him a question because he was going to tell you his way. Norma, still uh, <laughs> kissing the girls at 82? Still working at 82? No. Still well, making people laugh at 82? Uh, more than 82, girls. <laughs> <laughs> I was speaking of your years. It's oh. impossible to think oh, of my you. Ear. My years are all right. <laughs> It was extremely funny, and of course the audience enjoyed the fact that he ran rings round me, he popped up all over the place, he was totally dangerous, unpredictable, and always very funny. As the cameras stopped rolling on the Esther show, Norman's antics continued. And the audience uh, clapped, and the, as the applause died, Norman leant forward, looked me straight in the eyes, and licked the end of my nose. A sensation I will never forget. Hasn't happened much since. Norman would often push the boundaries of protocol. Throughout his career, he was a firm favorite of the royal family, appearing at nine command performances and coming face to face with royalty on many memorable occasions. I had him working at St. James's Palace once, but I had to lead the line-up along uh, to, for all the artists to meet the Duchess of Kent. Vera Lynn was on the show as well. And I said to Norman, if you stand next to Vera, he said, no, 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 I'm doing that. So he hid behind a big pillar until I'd introduced the Duchess of Kent to all the artists. And then he jumped out on her and went, Ugh! <laughs> Brian had, and I thought, you can't do that to royalty, but that's the way he is. He forgets that they are royalty and just they're friends to him, so he just joins in the fun. He had me chasing around St James's Palace on one occasion. We were there at a, a tea party for the Queen Mother. She she used to run these tea parties for ex-servicemen and, and, and uh, he uh, was there on one occasion and, of course, he was always p playing the fool and, and he was chasing me <laughs> I'm trying to twitch my nose. But uh, that was him, you know, he, he couldn't help but uh, play the fool. When he went to get his honour, Prince Philip met him, and everyone's waiting in this big room, you see, waiting for the Queen to appear, and uh, Prince Philip came over to him and said, hello, Norman, how are you doing? And he said, oh, thank you, sir, fine, and one thing, another. Then all of a sudden there was a... You know, the trumpet going up. And uh, Norman said, what's that? And, and, and Prince Philip said, oh, that'll be the Queen. And Norman said, bloody hell, she can't half play that trumpet, can she? <laughs> For the first time in a quarter of a century, the Queen has been visiting the Isle of Man. Waiting to meet her was the island's allegedly most famous resident and royal favourite, Sir Norman Wisdom. Jenny Bond reports on today's gripping encounter. This was the Queen's first visit to the Isle of Man for 25 years, and she took the precaution of wearing a sprig of its national herb, mugwort, on her lapel. It's supposed to ward off evil spirits. It did not, however, ward off the rather persistent attentions of Sir Norman Wisdom. Now 88 is an old favourite among the royals who's performed for them at Windsor Castle. Taking the Queen firmly by the hand as she arrived at a cheese stall, he invited her to pose with him for the photographers. Next, he suggested she should try some of the cheese. No, not now. Not now, said the Queen, showing him instead that she was being given some to take away. But Sir Norman wanted a longer chat. Ignoring royal protocol, he crept up and touched her on the arm, then took her hand and hung on and on. I don't think the Queen will forget him. <laughs> it was quite a surprise to me when I heard, uh, you know, he's given her a piece of cheese to eat. Terrible, really. I mean, who else would do that but Norman Wisdom?
And who else but Norman Wisdom could achieve the status of a country's hero? His visual comedy has always appealed to audiences in Eastern Europe, nowhere more so than in Albania. A lot of the uh, dictatorship over there, especially in Albania, thought that Norman represented the downtrodden communist uh, by the capitalist, which is untrue completely. The people were, were kind of subjected to a pretty awful regime and the only joy of which came when they saw, on maybe on Sunday night, the Norman Wisdom film. They were shown every week and it's kept going. You know, for 30, 40, 50 years they've just had Norman Wisdom and, and so he's so in their hearts, it's extraordinary. And in 2002, Tony Hawk saw a chance to win a bizarre challenge. Well, I took on a wacky bet that I had to have a hit record somewhere in the world within two years, because I'd had a hit record in 1988 with a song called Stutter Rap by Maurice Minor and the Majors, and somebody called me a one-hit wonder, and I said, well, I haven't finished living my life yet. I'll probably have another hit. So I set off going all around the world trying to have this hit and failed until I struck upon this idea of pure genius, which was to involve myself with Norman Wisdom in Albania. Remarkably, Tony persuaded Oscar-winning lyricist Sir Tim Rice to write the song. So Sir Tim phoned Sir Norman. I was excluded from that conversation. I rang him up and put forward this strange proposition that he should record a song for us, which would be a top 20 hit in Albania. And uh, Norman agreed, you know, oh, I'll do it if you say, yeah, we're Albanian, oh, yeah, they like me there, yeah, I'll do it. We therefore wrote a song, Tony and I, called Big in Albania. And Norman went along with this. He loved the idea, and he came down to London and he recorded it. The next plan was Operation Tour Albania. The morning we left at Heathrow Airport, uh, Norman began the journey by running up the down escalator at 87 years old and going straight through the uh, security cordon without going through the bit in the middle. He walked up the side of it. And this was only, uh, you know, six months after September the 11th and security was very high and Norman walked straight through it and into sock shop the other side. He was always doing his act, but in a way it wasn't his act. It was Norman being Norman. He just had this desire, this necessity to entertain. I'm amazed that in some places we went to, he wasn't shot. <laughs> In Albania, everybody loves Norman. It was like a scene for Take That, but with an 87-year-old man. It was extraordinary. He got lost on at least two occasions, but always turned up. We just looked for a big crowd, and there he was. <laughs> and the little shepherds and all these fellas with donkeys up the hill would say, ah, Pitkini, Pitkini, ah, we love you, we love you. And he was getting kissed by men, kids, boys, girls, all sorts of people. They just loved him out there. I made my name in many places, a thousand falls, a thousand places, but nowhere's more devoted than Albania. Miming superbly with Tim's daughter on backing vocals, his son on trumpet, Sir Tim was happy to perform on a plastic toy saxophone. We were all thrilled to be in the presence of somebody that my kids thought was as funny as I did. As I wandered down his fine Albanian street. Well, I had this dream that if we were going to be a supergroup, which Norman Wisdom and the Pitkins clearly were, uh, that we had to perform a stadium gig. So I arranged for us to perform at half-time at the National Football Stadium in Tirana. Norman Wisdom and the Pickens did not disappoint their fans. Well, the outcome of the bet was rather a happy conclusion in that the Albanian people in their 20s and 30s voted for us and we reached the dizzy heights of number 18 in the Albanian charts, so we all celebrated on the way back. And Norman, of course, had had his first hit in Albania. And surely that's everyone's ambition, isn't it?
For the last 30 years of Norman's life, he lived on the Isle of Man. It was a place close to his heart. He lived in Isle of Man in a beautiful house. He designed it himself. He had these fabulous cars which he used to try and design. He had a huge, a massive, massive ocean-going yacht which he designed himself. He just became like Lord of the Manor out there. I came here in 1978 to do a summer season at the Gaiety of Kedda, just down the road here in Douglas. And I've never been here before. I couldn't believe how beautiful the place was. And the time was coming where I was I did want to work all the time, just sort of semi-retirement, if you like to call it. And so I got a place here, and I've never been happier. Lovely. I'd like to put on record that I need you, need you, need you. Throughout his life, so Norman supported good causes, always putting his talents to good use. Talents which were many and varied. I love you. It simply means, my darling, that I love you. Well, he had a very lovely voice, soft, and he, uh, he knew how to get the best out of a song. And, of course, this was an added talent for his uh, work. And it was different, too, because... It brought the comedy down, and I think people enjoyed that as much as they did his antics. <laughs> people don't realise what a great musician he is. He was absolutely incredible. Seven or eight instruments, yeah. His passions in life, he loved golf. He was a great golfer, even though, uh, you know, at his age, uh, a lot of people were sort of sitting in armchairs and feet up watching the telly, but he was out there. He loved motorbikes, loved motorbikes, cars. We couldn't go anywhere without stopping at a car showroom. But even his friends would admit he had one or two unsettling character traits. He always used to eat and show his food, which was a bit... <laughs> and he would be like, um forking the food into his mouth like that, and he said to me, Robbo, you call me Robbo, Robbo, do you like seafood? I said, yes, OK. He goes, nah, like that. Uh, seafood. <laughs> Quite often, he'd listen to his own tapes or his own films. He liked his own films. He used to sit in the car, and we'd go for a drive, and he would sing to me and all the stuff that he'd written. But that's the way he was. <laughs> Norman Wisdom has become the great British clown, very much in the mold of Charlie Chaplin with his little man in the ill-fitting suit and cloth cap. Now, he has the honour of being the national comedy hero of Albania, and not many people could make that boast. In his lifetime, Norman received many honours, including an OBE and the Variety Club Award. Outstanding contribution to show business. <laughs> Sir Norman Wisdom. Oh, here he goes. I have to say how very grateful I am. <laughs> As you did say, I've been 50 years in show business now, and you were wrong. <laughs> it's nearly 55. <laughs> and I'm very grateful to get this, really I am, and I'm a very lucky little devil being in show business in the first place, and I've been a lucky little devil all the time because it's given me happiness and I thoroughly enjoyed myself, and on top of that, you get paid. <laughs> Norman continued his career into his 90s. Aged 89, he played a fitness-obsessed pensioner in Coronation Street. At 92, he took on his last acting role in a film for charity called Expresso. By now, Norman's health was in decline with Alzheimer's. He would still want to keep his finger in the pie a little bit, and, of course, something like that was perfect because there were no lines, because at that point, you know, his, his memory was, you know, not that good. And, of course, that's what Dad excelled in, you know, with the facial expressions and that perfect timing that he has. In his final years, he remained on the Isle of Man. His family, including two proud grandsons, took turns to look after him. Slower, Greggy. 
Very nice, very nice. It was just so nice to be with somebody that was always light and breezy and joking. And Norman just didn't know how to be sad or unhappy. <laughs> in 2007, the decision was reached to place him in a care home, but he was happy there. His family were really his life, and the way that he, you know, kept in contact and everybody would go and see him. I mean, he was a very, very much a family man. All the family were present when he received the award he held most dear, a knighthood from the Queen in the year 2000. Sir Norman Wisdom for services to entertainment. So Norman Wisdom's career spanned more than half a century in theater, film, and television. Wherever he went, Norman could be depended upon for one thing, to create laughter. Just a minute, Mr. Pickin. Thank you, Mr. Pitkin. Oh. You obviously don't realize, but you've just done something wonderful. Me? Hmm. I think he's continued the great tradition of, of the silent comics, the ones who provided so much genius for us on the screen, the sort of, uh, the Chaplin little man. It seemed to me that his idea was life has been hell and let's make the most of every minute we have now. <laughs> You're joking. He just wanted to prove that he could be something in life and he was something in life. It's a very British story of class and snobbery and tremendous hardship. What we admire is something that we feel we can't do. And not many people could do what Norman Wisdom did. Dickens could have written about him, couldn't he? He's like a figure out of Dickens. But he was brilliant. I think his legacy will live on, actually. I think his films will always be, will be there for people to see. There is one thing that no one will ever be able to destroy, and that is the love I have for my father. I would say he's got more opportunity than most to be remembered. I don't think you'll forget, we'll forget Norman somehow. Some 